Ready to break free from algorithms, vanity PR, and money-sucking ads? My name's Larissa Worstiak, and I've learned in seven years of jewelry marketing that content is the crown jewel. My agency, Joy Joya, takes a holistic approach, leading with laser-focused storytelling, impactful content creation, and strategic content distribution. This method has worked for the solopreneur as well as the multi-million dollar company. And now I'm sharing these systems and tactics with you. Here's to standing out in the sea of sparkle. This is episode 234, and today I'll be explaining how you can take all the pieces of what we reviewed so far in Jewelry Marketing Jumpstart and then fit those building blocks into a jewelry marketing content strategy. We've covered so many topics related to effective jewelry marketing content, including brand identity, storytelling, audience personas, competitive analysis, auditing your content, setting goals, and measuring your goals. Now, all of this pre-work that you've done will help you form your strategy. And then after you create and finalize that strategy, you'll be in an ideal position to start brainstorming a wealth of content that fits your unique value proposition and is aligned with your business goals. For the sake of those listeners and viewers who will be DIYing this exercise, I'll keep the process and execution very simple, and you'll be thrilled to know that it can be accomplished in one single page. In this episode, I'll be discussing what to include in your one-page strategy for jewelry marketing content, the considerations you'll want to make before committing to the strategy, and expectations for outcomes, as well as how you can mentally prepare yourself for the next steps. From now through early July, I'm offering a free, yes, free six-month podcast guided program called Jewelry Marketing Jumpstart, which I'm sure you've gathered by now involves weekly audio and video lessons, as well as companion PDF downloads for each new episode. Jumpstart members also get a bonus template for this episode featuring a one-page jewelry marketing content strategy so you won't have to start from scratch. If you want to sign up for that free full program right away and get the companion PDF download to this episode as well as all the others, visit joyjoya.com slash jump, link in the show notes as well. But before we get to the solid gold, I'd like to take a moment to remind you that this podcast has both audio and video, so you can either listen on your favorite podcast platform or watch on YouTube by searching Joy Joya. You can support the podcast for free by taking the time not only to subscribe, but also to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. And if you leave a review, I would love to read it on a future episode. So please let me know what you think about this one or about any other major takeaways you've had from past episodes. Speaking of podcasts, did you know I also co-host another podcast with jewelry marketer Liz Kantner? It's called Success with Jewelry. We've already released like, 28 free episodes everywhere you listen to podcasts as well as on YouTube. And we have an insider community where we share extended episodes, hands-on guidance, and a plethora of resources. Visit successwithjewelry.com to learn more. Okay, my sparklers, let's get into the next installment of Jewelry Marketing Jumpstart, all about formulating your one-page jewelry marketing content strategy. Again, you can visit joyjoya.com slash jump for the companion PDF and bonus template to get started on your own strategy. So first, of course, we need to talk about what to include in this one-page strategy for jewelry marketing content. There's a few different elements, again, that download template will have it all listed out for you so you don't have to take notes, but I think it's important to listen so you get an understanding of where we're going. So the first thing you need to include in your one-page strategy is your goal. 
Most small to mid-sized jewelry brands will have just one primary goal, which of course is perfect for a one-page strategy where you don't have a lot of space to elaborate. If you remember from the goals and KPIs episode, these categories of goals include brand awareness, engagement, conversion, and then retention or getting repeat customers. So you wanna choose the one area of focus for your goal and then write a more detailed, smart version of that goal next to it. So here are two examples. One, our goal is brand awareness. As a measure of our success in gaining brand awareness, we strive to bring 5,000 new users to our e-commerce website by the end of six months. Or, our goal is brand awareness. As a measure of our success in gaining brand awareness, we strive to add 500 new subscribers to our email marketing list within the next three months. So make whatever version of that make sense for your business and what you wanna achieve, and that's gonna be the first section of your strategy. Next, you wanna have like a go-to summary of your audience personas, which if you wanna go reference that, I have an episode about that back a few episodes ago. So the actual audience persona should be very detailed and exist as their own document. Maybe you want to upload them to Google Drive and then you can link to them in this strategy or like have some kind of reference to know where you can go find the extended version. But in this one page strategy, I want you to just put a one to two sentence summary of each audience persona. And then again, make a note or a reference to where you can find the full thing. It's really important to note in in these one to two sentences, two main points. So one, why this person will choose to buy from you. And then two, what would potentially hold them back from buying from you? So here's an example. Anna is a 40-year-old mom who lives in an affluent suburb of a major metropolitan area, and she'll ultimately decide to buy from us because she connects with our irreverent voice and loves our unique designs. She might hold back if we don't have some kind of charitable, charitable giving strategy because she really wants to support companies that give back to the community. So that's an example. It has the why Anna would buy and what would potentially hold Anna back from buying and also some like a summary of some demographic information there too. And again, there should be like an extended expanded version of this, but in the strategy, you're just putting a summary. This way you'll have a really quick reference and be able to keep your personas front and center in your mind with this strategy and with every piece of content that you generate moving forward. The next thing you wanna have in your one page content strategy is your key storytelling tenets. So what I mean by that is you'll have about three to five bullet points of absolutely non-negotiable elements of your brand story. These are the things that distinguish your brand from the next one and are repeated very frequently in email marketing campaigns, social media posts, in product descriptions, on the about page, etc. So let's pretend you're the brand Monica Rich Kosan, which if you're not familiar, you should look them up just so you can kind of understand what I'm talking about. But if you were this brand, your key storytelling tenets would probably be something like, we empower our customers by helping them tell their their own stories. We love seeing our customers dream big and reach for the stars. And then this is actually a direct quote from their website that I thought was so foundational in their storytelling. We are a certified B Corporation committed to the highest standards for quality and excellence as we build a more sustainable jewelry collection. 
So list out the things that are just non-negotiable. Non-negotiable. They are the DNA of your brand. They make you who you are as a brand. The next thing you want to have in your strategy is your strategic content objectives, i.e. how we're going to move toward the goal that we listed at the top. So these are three to five bullet points about how we're going to use content to help us reach our goal. And I want these to be more general and conceptual so we're not yet drilling down into the tactics, into the types of content that you'll be creating, which will come later in the plan. These are more like, in general, what do you kind of strive to communicate or how do you strive to communicate with your target audience? So examples would be educate customers about our specific product category and be a go-to resource. Focus on providing value rather than selling at the customer. Give information in a captivating way. Anticipate and address customer questions and concerns. And build trust with customers through transparent and authentic communication. The next thing you want to have in there after the objectives is the content types within your capabilities. So a few episodes ago, I also listed out a lot of different types of content marketing, and you really just want to like pick and choose from that list, knowing your skills, knowing the resources you have available, whether that's team members, money, outsourcing capabilities, your own time and talent, What is within your capabilities to execute on? What feels doable? I just want you to list those out at this point. So as a refresher, those options are blog posts, homepage content, about us page content, other landing pages on your website, educational materials, storytelling on product pages or product descriptions, gift guides or other free downloads, printed marketing assets, direct mail marketing, video and audio content, and quizzes and other interactive content. And then lastly, in this strategy, you're going to have your strengths, weaknesses, and the opportunities. So for strengths, when it comes to your marketing content, what did you already find that you're doing well and can build upon? This is something you would have discovered in the content audit. Again, something we had talked about a few episodes ago. What are your natural talents and existing resources? Write that out in like one to three sentences. When it comes to weaknesses, where will you struggle with content and what resources do you not have access to at this time? What are the blind spots that you need to be aware of and how can you avoid falling into traps? Again, write one to three sentences about that. And then finally, the opportunities. In a few sentences, summarize what you remember were the greatest opportunities when you were researching your competitors. How can you shine in ways that they don't? How can you stand apart? I want you to document this here so you'll always remember it. Easy peasy, right? There is your one-page content strategy. Again, you can sign up at joyjoya.com jump and you'll get access to a worksheet with a template so you can do this yourself. Now, before you decide to truly commit to this strategy, there are definitely some considerations you'll want to make. Now that you have all the high level insights and objectives in one central place, you may at this point realize that you actually have to go back and do some additional work. Like maybe you could kind of like dig a little deeper into those audience personas. Maybe you skipped some steps in the competitive analysis, whatever it may be, that's totally normal. This is all a process, so you may need to revisit those foundational elements as you move forward and learn more information about every aspect of your business. Consider this strategy to be a living and breathing document. 
And then in terms of the goals, maybe you find out that you have multiple goals or you're a bigger, more established business. You can absolutely add them to this strategy. I'm not limiting you to one goal, but then you have to know that your document will probably be longer than a page. And then all the nuances of your strategy will be much more complex and multifaceted. So at this time, as you're kind of getting used to this new way of thinking, of strategizing that I'm sharing with you, it's probably best to stick with one goal, but just know that you're not limited to that. And also, now that you've outlined your strengths and weaknesses, ask yourself, is there anything you can do in the meantime, or even right now, to make your strengths even stronger? Or can you find ways to lessen the impact of your weaknesses and ensure ensure that they're not pulling you down? This is a great time to kind of explore those things further. And let's also talk about expectations for marketing outcomes and how you can really mentally prepare yourself for the next steps after this. So first of all, I say this a lot, but I gotta say it again. Know that marketing is a commitment and a long game. It just is. So think about, take like a whole day to reflect and think about what can you do for yourself to prepare for that reality? Do you need a daily meditation and journaling practice? Do you need to incorporate affirmations into your day? Do you need a vision board to kind of help you stay focused on the goal and where you're going? Do you need to kind of check in with milestones that kind of reaffirm you and help you feel good about the direction you're going in? Do you need a coach or an accountability partner? I want you to really set yourself up for success in this process and give yourself, empower yourself with the tools that you're going to need because it's going to be a journey. There's no, there's no shortcut. There's no sugarcoating that. Also, I want you to start thinking about your personal brainstorming style because we'll be talking about brainstorming very soon in the coming episodes, how you can start brainstorming those amazing content topics that are in alignment with your strategy. And I think also continue to have a strong vision for your brand voice And think more, keep it in the front of your mind, the shape your brand personality is going to take on in your content. Another exercise that I think would be great would be start paying attention to other content, marketing content that you see in the world. Become a student of marketing and observe how you feel when you interact with things like website content, email campaigns, social media posts, etc. What do you like and dislike? I want you to maybe even keep a journal and write down observations or keep like what's called a swipe file. So that can be like a Dropbox folder or a Google Drive folder where you put screenshots of things that inspire you, marketing related, or even things that you hate, (laughs) just to remind yourself like this is not what I want to be. And over time, If you keep up with that, you'll have a whole resource for yourself that you can reference and keep building upon as you kind of evolve in this marketing journey. Okay, that's it for now. Much more to come in future episodes. Go to joyjoya.com slash jump for more information as well as that free strategy template. Before we get into the gold mine, as well as my jewelry marketing news roundup, I want to share a case study of a jewelry brand that I think embodies what I just spoke about. All right, so these are my thoughts about how I'd apply this lesson to a jewelry brand in the wild. So disclaimer, this brand is not my client, so I don't have any inside information, just sharing my observations. So I actually already touched upon this brand 
very briefly earlier in the episode, but I wanted to mention them again because while I was kind of reviewing their brand storytelling, I discovered they have a very interesting blog called The Journal, and I'll put the link to it in the show notes if you want to check it out for yourself. As you know from what I briefly mentioned, Monica Rich Kosan is all about inspiring and empowering women, bringing meaningful jewelry into their customers' lives. So on the first page of the journal, which has 10 posts, 10 blog posts up there, the titles of half the posts, this is something I just noticed while I was scrolling. Half of the posts have the word meaning in their title, which I think is so very telling of the deep connection that the brand wants to communicate in their storytelling. And it it's just like subconsciously gives you that feeling that they want to share with their customers, that this is not superficial and sur- surface level. They care about connection. So I clicked on one post called the powerful index finger ring meaning. And I was really intrigued by this because I don't hear a lot of brands really talking about index fingers in relation to jewelry. It's kind of a niche and specific topic, but I think it really matches the brand so well because they're all about meaning and intention. And very conveniently, Monica Rich Kosan also happens to sell a lot of stackable rings that are perfect for wearing on an index finger. Surprise! (laughs) It's definitely a more underrepresented jewelry category for them since they're known for their lockets, but I really like that they're using the blog as a way to give some attention to something that maybe their customers don't know them for or that they're not really highlighting in their other marketing. And then the end of this one post about index fingers really comes back to their consistent messaging about wanting their customers to tell their own story through jewelry and being empowered. And the quote says, you can choose to embrace the index ring meaning in a way that best suits your own story. No matter how you choose to appreciate its significance, the ring is sure to stand as a powerful symbol of leadership to yourself and others. So what will this mean for you? We'll let you decide, end quote. And I just thought, It was so consistent with the story they're telling. Like, we're just here with the jewelry. You decide how you want to express and empower yourself. And you can take what we have and kind of make it your own. And I love that that message comes through in literally everything they say. So I just wanted to share that as a great example. What do you think? Let me know in a podcast review or a YouTube comment. Okay, let's get into the gold mine. So the gold mine is a recurring segment of this podcast that's a little bit more personal take from me talking about entrepreneurship, motivation, things like that. In this episode, I want to be talking about how to start something that's difficult or daunting related to your jewelry business. And I thought this was a really appropriate topic because I'm talking about forming a strategy, kind of building the foundation that the house of your marketing is going to be sitting on and that it will be supporting And it's something that you'll be committing to for a long time. So I think that can be really intimidating for some people to begin, kind of get the ball rolling on it because it's this big, overwhelming thing. So let's talk about some tactics for starting. How do you do it? How do you get out of your own way? How do you have faith and kind of stick to it and have the confidence that you know you are doing the right thing for your business. These are some tips that I have and that I personally do use a lot. So first, I think I know, I know you need to take marketing less seriously. I know that probably sounds crazy because 
marketing is serious. It is your business. I take marketing seriously, but you kind of have to stop taking it so seriously in order to get out of your own way. So you're probably shocked by that. And you're like, but everything I do in marketing is going to make or break my business. It's not true. The biggest brands in the world are marketing forever, and it's a constant process of figuring out what works. There is no set in stone guide to how you're going to succeed in marketing. So might as well start thinking of it as a sandbox rather than like a china cabinet and start having fun with it. You want to get in, get dirty, have fun, and not be precious about it because nothing's going to break, I promise you, as long as you have the right intention and you keep at it and you're invest- investing time and attention into it. So hey, jump right in. <laughs> Second, you need to know that it's going to change inevitably, like regardless of anything, it's going to change. You're going to have to edit it, possibly do it over no matter what. So say to yourself when you sit down to start, this is going to change. I think that helps in reducing the feeling you may have that this thing needs to be perfect or immaculate. Because even if it is quote unquote perfect, which it will never be, I'm sorry, perfectionists out there, it's going to change anyway. So what's the point in agonizing over it? Defin- of course, definitely give it your best effort in the moment. Like do what you can with what you know and with the resources that you have, but also keep it fluid and let yourself be open to the change that will inevitably happen. And then my third tip is, if you're daunted by how long something's going to take because you know it's going to be a long process, personally, I find it helpful to tell myself that the time's going to pass anyway. And we all say, wow, I can't believe it's March already. You know, it was just the holidays. And that time passed like in a moment. So it's better to get started now at least you will have the data and insights that you wouldn't have had if you did not start at all. I know when I work with new clients that come to me and they need a reset on their marketing, a lot of them feel embarrassed about what they have been doing up to the point when they talk to me. And I'm I say don't be embarrassed because I'm honestly so excited and I tell them they should be excited because you're coming to me, you've tried, and guess what we have as a result of that? We have data. We have a frame of reference. We have something that we can build upon because you took the initiative and got started even if it wasn't perfect, even if you're embarrassed by it. This is actually better for me and puts everyone in a better situation than a brand that has put things off for a really long time, never implemented any of their ideas, even if they were imperfect. Because then we have, we're starting from square one and that that's a difficult place to be. So in most cases, doing the best you can as soon as you can is better than doing it quote unquote perfect later because again, perfect isn't real and we won't know what your perfect can and should be until we've been, until we've gotten started and we've been doing this for a while. So Let me know in a YouTube comment or podcast review if you can relate to this. Do you have trouble getting started? And what do you feel holds you back from starting? And hopefully that helped motivate you a little bit. Okay, let's get into the news roundup where I share three relevant articles related to jewelry and or marketing. So this first one comes from New York Times and I love it because it speaks to the power 
of storytelling and how the stories often in the details. So the article is called Jewelry Fans Recognize Their Favorites. Some jewelry shoppers are turning to lesser known independent jewelry brands that have recognizable motifs, shapes, and styles that convey exclusivity and sophistication to those in the know. And these brands often lack extensive advertising in global boutiques. They're not owned by large corporations. To give you some examples, they include Marie Lichtenberg, Ted Muling, Elise Ciccolini, I'm sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly, Polly Wales, Sophie Billy Brahe, and Anissa Kermishi, whose Le Derriere necklace and other pieces have attracted a community of fans who appreciate edgy designs. And the appeal of these brands is partly due to their cultural exclusiveness and the storytelling associated with like the details that make them recognizable. So my main takeaway is by using unique, recognizable details in their designs or having something quirky about their storytelling, about their brand identity, those things help the jewelry be noticed like in the wild by other people who would be in the know. So like if you're part of the cool crowd and you're familiar with say Polly Wales and you saw someone wearing a Polly Wales ring, you could be like, oh my God, I love your ring. I recognize that. And then suddenly these two people have this connection that they're kind of part of this group of people that both share the values and like the aesthetic that that brand cultivates. So these brands are really selling entrance into a community of people who value luxury, coolness, style, and exclusivity. And I think those things are even more important than the unique details themselves. And it has to do with that inner circle of fans and people who have the privilege to afford and acquire this jewelry. The next article comes from Social Media Today, and it's called more social media discussion is moving to messaging, which is important for marketers to note. So there's a trend now towards private messaging rather than public posting on social media platforms, and it's only continuing, with more users opting to share their updates within intimate circles, in direct messages, or like in group messages. And this shift is due to this divisive nature of conversations within social apps. I think there's more political and topical discussions. People don't want to deal with the arguments and the angst, so they are more apt to share with their trusted close friends on like niche interests and topics that they can enjoy with these people that they're connected with. So as a result, platforms like Meta are focusing on messaging with new features such as channels on Instagram and the reintegration of Messenger into the main Facebook app. So as a brand, you should have a strategy for checking your DMs regularly and like your DM requests. Also in your calls to action, in your captions and in your stories, Do you encourage followers and fans to DM you for more information? And have you ever even DM'd a user or a fan who regularly interacts with your content? My main takeaway is this shift could have significant implications for marketing as brands may need to consider incorporating DMs and providing more ways for customers to message them directly. This could also potentially impact engagement metrics for social media with DM interaction increasing. So then customers and fans are engaging privately rather than in comments and in likes. So it's a really interesting shift to think about as we move forward. And then the last article comes from domino.com, the ultimate guide for a stylish life and home. It's called The perfect pink paint with the cutest name drenches this jewelry designer's Bay Area office. So this 
article slash interviews showcases the office of jewelry designer Ariel Gordon located in the Bay Area. The article highlights the functionality and aesthetic appeal of the space, which fosters creativity and collaboration among Gordon and her team. I thought it was really cool how the brand story and values were embodied in the space, the physical space, and how the brand found an opportunity to communicate that through content by partnering with Domino for this interview. So the design incorporates natural elements like wood and stone, as well as plants to create a warm and inviting atmosphere. And Gordon's personal touch is evident throughout the space with photographs and personal items displayed on shelves and walls. And even the pink paint color has meaning and significance. My main takeaway from this is maybe think about some offbeat ways that you can tell your brand story. It doesn't always have to be like an explanation. You know, it can kind of run parallel to the written story or like the history of your brand. Like Ariel Gordon did, that happens to be embodied in the office space. And then you can show rather than tell the story and really like demonstrate it through the details. That's it for today. Did you have any questions about Jewelry Marketing Jumpstart? You can always email me Larissa, L-A-R-Y-S-S-A at joyjoya.com. If you love this podcast, please share it with a friend who'd appreciate it. And don't forget to subscribe as well as leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're completely new to digital marketing, then you'll want to purchase and read a copy of my book, Jewelry Marketing Joy. Visit joyjoya.com slash book for more information.